We left off last week with our four young men, young teenagers, perhaps 14 years old, having been hauled away from their homes to a far off land, the capital of enemy territory. And then they were given immense privilege, scholarship to a world-class education, the best food, the best accommodations, access to power, privilege, with the full expectation that they would be bound in loyalty to Nebuchadnezzar and therefore be useful in his court. How will they fare? How will they fare under the king's edict of changed names, a changed diet, and indoctrination? Will they compromise? To begin our time tonight, I want to turn your attention to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 asks the question that we must ask in the sort of cliffhanger between Daniel chapter 1, verse 7, and what follows from verse 8. In Psalm 119, beginning in verse 9, we have this question. How can a young man keep his way pure? And the answer right there, by keeping it according to your word. With all my heart, the psalmist writes, I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. And we see right there in the beginning a recognition that the word of God was going to be the anchor for a young man to keep his way pure. And we see right there in that same stanza this dependence upon the Lord. Keep me, don't let me wander. A recognition of a wandering tendency in our own hearts. I had a 1967 Mustang in high school and uh, while it was a wonderful car to drive, it had zero amenities except one, a dramatic pull into oncoming traffic. If you didn't hold on to the wheel with both hands, it was pulling left. And it took constant vigilance to keep that car going straight. And the human heart is like that. The Christian heart is like that. And so the heartbeat is, Lord, keep me from wandering. Keep me from pulling left. I need your word. I need your help. Look down at verse 97 of Psalm 119. A recognition that I need God's word as my regular meditation will have certain effects in a life. Look at these. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet. to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts, I get understanding. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, their appearance seemed better and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence and in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus, the king. What do we see here in this passage? Simply this, God is demonstrating his own power and his own purposes in Babylon through his choice servants who are in exile. God is demonstrating his own power and his own purpose while in Babylonian exile through these four young men. That's what we're looking at tonight. And you remember this whole scenario of the Babylonian exile and Daniel and these four youths in Babylon is theological. It is a clash of worldviews. It is a clash of theologies. It is a clash of the one true God, Yahweh of Israel, over and against all of the false gods and the idolatries of the pagan nations surrounding them. Israel is in exile because of their own idolatry and forsaking Yahweh. God said, you want the idols of the nations? Go serve the idols of the nations. And they would for the next 70 years. You remember that the pagan nations would be tempted to think our God's better than your God because look who won the battle and now we have your nobles as our captives. And God is in the business of putting his own glory on display even here in exile. He's gonna let everybody know that he truly is God. He's gonna let his servants know. He's gonna let the king know. He'll let the empire know. And so we see God demonstrating this, first of all, in God giving Daniel resolute faith and circumstantial favor. We see this beginning in verse 8. God gave Daniel resolute faith and circumstantial favor. Notice in verse 8, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank, so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel was faced with several Babylonifications, Babylonizations, uh, the reworking of a worldview to Babylonian ways of living and thinking and loyalties. And there were several factors in that. One was the re-education. And Daniel submitted to that world-class re-education. He would go to school with the Babylonians. He would learn their literature. He would actually be very good at it. And Daniel submitted to the name changes. It, it would be really hard to do otherwise. If somebody wants to call you a name, it, it's difficult to get them to not call you that name. Uh, my nephew insists on introducing me to everyone he sees as Andrew. And while my mother would be proud of that, it is what she named me. Uh, nowadays, really only the IRS calls me Andrew. Everybody else calls me Smedley, except my nephew Micah, who insists on telling everybody his name is AKA. Andrew. And you just can't really help that. Daniel wasn't going to be able to help the Babylonians calling him Belteshazzar. And so he submitted to that. But notice that whenever Daniel refers to himself, he calls himself Daniel. He didn't forget. But he didn't make a big protest out of the name change. But when it came to diet, when it came to eating the king's food, Daniel did not submit. Daniel did not submit. This comes out of Daniel's resolute faith. Daniel's resolute faith. Notice verse 8, the word defile shows up twice. What is that all about? It means moral and ceremonial defilement. That is the way the word is used 11 times in the Old Testament. And it refers specifically to eating things 
that were defiled, either because they were the wrong kinds of foods outside of Mosaic law, or they were prepared in an unmosaic law fashion, or they were offered in idolatrous worship. And, and all of these things were true in Babylon. Uh, it was a regular fare for the Babylonians to eat pig. I can get along with that. They also ate horse. I'm not so sure about that one. It was also likely that they did not properly drain the blood from meat, and that went against Mosaic law. And really, the big deal here was that the food had been prepared for and presented to idols. Remember, everything on the king's table was given to Marduk, Nebuchadnezzar's favorite god. And in giving it to Marduk, Marduk graciously gave to Nebuchadnezzar all that Marduk didn't eat. And since Marduk doesn't actually exist because he's not a real god, Nebuchadnezzar got to eat all of it that was given in celebration to Marduk. And then he shared that with people who were of high privilege and high standing. And he shared that with all the nobles that he'd gotten as youths from all the nations he'd conquered to raise them up, buy off their loyalties, give them the best of the best, and secure for himself good servants from all the nations. And Daniel would not submit to eating the king's food. And it's not that meat was bad or even that wine was bad. We find out later in Daniel chapter 10 that Daniel ate meat and drank wine. And there's no reason to think that later in Daniel's roles in government, he would not have been able to procure food that met Mosaic law standards and was not offered to idols. But here, as a slave student, he had no choice in how the food was prepared or what the food was. And so we come against this really small decision. Are you going to eat what's put in front of you? I mean, that's only the right thing to do. You're taught that. Eat everything on your plate. Eat what's put in front of you. That is good manners. Is Daniel going to follow good manners? And this small decision that Daniel has to make really is a tacit admission that Marduk is God. It is a buying into Babylonian theology in eating a meal. And so he made up his mind, verse 8. And this is fascinating. The, the Hebrew text here literally says, he set upon his heart that he would not defile himself. And if you go back to verse 7, we read there that the commander of the officials assigned new names to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Literally, he set upon them new names. And twice in verse 7, you have the commander of the officials setting upon the Hebrew youths new names. And in the very next verse, but Daniel set upon his own heart not to defile himself. It's a striking contrast in the original. Daniel set his heart not to sin against God. Todd Dykstra has said, an uncompromising life always springs from a commitment to personal holiness. This is exactly what Daniel has done. He has pre-committed to being set apart unto Yahweh. And so when it comes to eating food that Yahweh has prohibited, prepared in ways that Yahweh has prohibited, and offered to idols which Yahweh despises, Daniel will abstain. Daniel has been prepared for this moment. This was not a, a whimsical decision made up at the last second. He has set his heart upon this. This is not a whim or a spur-of-the-moment decision. And if you think back to Israel's history, you go back a few Judean kings in Daniel's own lifetime. Daniel was most likely born right in the middle of Josiah's reign. And Josiah came to the throne in Judea after 57 years of Manasseh and Ammon punting spiritually and sacrificing the nation at the altars of all the idols of the wicked nations around them. 57 years of wicked kings leading the nation in corporate idolatry, and the boy king Josiah comes to the throne. And you remember his story. He feared Yahweh from his youth. And as king, he sought to rebuild the temple, to clear out the cobwebs and reestablish appropriate worship of Yahweh and in the cleaning up of the temple, do you remember what was found? God's word. 
And Josiah, the boy king, read God's word and tore his robes. We have disobeyed this. And 2 Chronicles 35 details that he went on to do the first uh, Passover meal that the nation had celebrated in generations, and it was the biggest one ever celebrated. He had a heart after God. This all took place in Daniel's early youth. Might it have made an impression on Daniel? Daniel, of course, was named Daniel. That name means God is my judge. Is it possible that Daniel had godly parents who were loyal to Yahweh, who wanted to name their son, don't be afraid of anybody, just fear the Lord. God is my judge. And we come to Daniel at this critical moment in the middle of verse eight says, so he sought permission. He is committed to not being defiled. And what is his next step? He sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Notice the demeanor of the man with resolute faith. I mean, Daniel here is a rock. He's not going to be moving anywhere. You can tell this is not a, a decision he's making without the cost, without risk assessment. And yet the way he approaches those over him is polite, tactful. He didn't embroider himself a don't tread on me flag and plant it in the ground. Daniel has unflinching conviction and courtesy. He makes an appeal. And he wants to see where this goes. But recognize that even making this appeal is still risky. He could lose his life of royalty. He could lose his scholarship. He could lose his privilege and access. Or he could lose his life. And that leads to God's circumstantial favor in verse 9. God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And this is interesting, the, the favor and compassion were not favor and compassion from God, it's favor and compassion from Ashpenaz that God gave. God gave Daniel favor and compassion from Ashpenaz, a, a, a Babylonian or a Persian government official in the Babylonian empire. And, and the two words here, the, the first one, favor, is the very common Hebrew word chesed. You may know it. It's, it's God's loving kindness. It's the Old Testament word for grace. And then compassion, and it's in a plural, and it has the idea of deep brotherly affections. And so what had gone on already in Daniel's life before this commander of officials, where he had such positive feelings towards Daniel. Loving compassion and brotherly affections. That may say something about Daniel's character that of course God has wrought, but it also indicates that God is the one who gives favor before men, even unbelievers. Notice God granted in verse nine. That is he gave, it's the same verb as uh, verse two, in chapter one, that Yahweh gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Uh, it's the same word as verse 17, God gave the youth's knowledge. Um, here in this verse, it's God gave Daniel favor and compassion. This is the theme of the book, that, that God is meticulously sovereign over the events of human history, and he is bringing about his kingdom. This is that same theme in miniature, in the life of an individual servant of Yahweh, in the life of an individual believer. The individual believer gets to see God at work, his invisible hand behind the scenes, granting favor in a relationship to a commander. God controls the hearts of men to accomplish his purposes. And we see this God granting favor to his people throughout biblical history. You may think of the Egyptians on their way out of slavery. God granted them favor in the eyes of the Egyptians so that they dispensed with their earrings and their manatee skins. I don't know where you get a manatee skin, but they, uh, they gave them all their stuff. Look at verse 10. And the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink, for why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? You would make me forfeit my head to the king. 
Now think about this, Ashpenaz doesn't owe Daniel anything, and yet he's giving Daniel this somewhat lengthy explanation. It's almost like an appeal. Oh, Daniel, you, you don't know what you're asking. I like you. But if you look bad, that makes me look bad. And if I look bad and I'm in charge of what you're supposed to eat, I'm going to lose my head. This would be a massive insult to King Nebuchadnezzar. And we talked about this last week. Nebuchadnezzar and Ashpenaz think they're doing these youths the best. They're, they're doing them good. They, they don't want them to be uh, poor and slovenly. They want them to be of good health. They want them to be well-nourished. They want them to be educated. They believe they're giving them the very best that Babylon has to offer. So to refuse that would be a massive insult. Now, Ashpenaz could have just said, who are you, slave, to talk back to me? Insolence equals execution. But instead, he reveals his own fear and his position before Nebuchadnezzar. And I don't know whether or not he liked Nebuchadnezzar, but it was appropriate to fear Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, how many times in the book of Daniel are we going to find this phrase, you will be torn limb from limb? That, that's just not nice or thrown into a fiery furnace. And Daniel isn't the only book in the Bible that, res that records Nebuchadnezzar throwing people into fiery furnaces. Jeremiah records it also. In Daniel 5.19, it is said that Nebuchadnezzar killed whomever he wished. So if the youths look gaunt, sluggish, haggard, there's going to be an inquiry. There's going to be an investigation. And the discovery will show that Ashpenaz was not following the king's orders and he would lose his head. That was his fear. This leads Daniel to make a different appeal. And so secondly in your outline tonight, we see God gave Daniel and company prudence and physical success. What is God doing in this passage here? He is, again, making a name for himself. He is showing himself superior to all the gods of the earth. He's reminding everybody that Israel is not captive because Yahweh is weak and Marduk is strong. He is putting on display his own power and his invisible hand behind all of history in meticulous sovereignty. And he gives Daniel and his friends prudence and physical success. Look at verse 11. Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. You see, Daniel here does not give up. Daniel was aware of how critical this moment was. If Daniel gives up quickly and compromises, we're not going to be reading about Daniel. This book doesn't exist. Daniel is not going to sin against God. And listen, it is really important how you make decisions as a teenager. You, you don't excuse yourself for your age and say, ah, you know, what could be expected of me? Here, Daniel is committed, pre-committed to not sinning against God. And so he makes another appeal. And this is where Daniel's prudence is on display. He, he asks the next lower level administrator. Notice verse 11. He said to the overseer whom the commander of the officials had appointed. The commander of the officials is Ashpenaz. Ashpenaz is in charge of this training regimen for these youths from all over the place. But the one under him is called the overseer. He is probably something like a, a guardian. He has a guardianship over them. A rector, he is making sure they do what they're supposed to do, and it's his stewardship to take care of them. And so Daniel goes to the steward, the guardian, who is one layer removed from Nebuchadnezzar. He doesn't have to answer directly to the king, and Daniel offers him an experiment, a test, an opportunity. And that experiment is going to be with vegetables and water. And, and you may already be thinking, look, it's, it's miraculous that Daniel and his friends do really well physically just by eating vegetables and water. You might think it's miraculous that they even ate vegetables. This, uh, the, the word for vegetables here is literally that which is sown. 
So it, it's not just that they had to only eat asparagus. Um, they could eat things from seed. So it would include things like vegetables, fruits, even grains, and things made from grains. And they would drink only water. That was the experiment. They would do that for 10 days and then be examined. And notice verse 14, so he listened to them in this matter and tested them for 10 days. Again, this was favor from God. God is orchestrating these events and giving favor to the young men. Now, this steward may have had some incentive. Maybe he gets to eat what the four youths don't eat, and that would have been the best food of Babylon. Um, maybe he also recognized that the risk in this experiment wasn't that great. He could take a chance. After 10 days, they, they couldn't be that bad. And maybe after 10 days, they'd be better, and I might look a little better for taking care of them this way. We don't know what was in his heart, but we do know that God steered it. So John Calvin said about this verse, men's hearts are divinely governed. We see God in charge of the whole scene. And God here honored Daniel's obedience. God gave success, physical success. Look at verse 15. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. Fatter sounds a little funny, 21st century, uh, you know, dietitians. Um, the idea there is well-nourished. And you would think that under the king's rich diet, the guys would put on weight. And here, with a grain and vegetable and fruit and water diet, these guys are putting on good weight. This really is remarkable. This is not about a new trick to healthy living, right? Don't go start the Daniel diet. Um, we'll find out later again that Daniel eats meat. The, the, the point is not be a vegetarian. The point is that they weren't going to be gaunt or weakened. Uh, they were, in fact, going to have good complexions. They were going to look healthy because God was with them. This was God's provision for them. Daniel, in faith, sought a way to avoid sinning against God, and God honored him with success. Now, would Daniel have honored God even if it cost him his life? I think so. We see that later in the book, do we not? Would his three friends have honored God in this moment, even if it cost them their lives? Well, later on, they were willing to do that very thing. And so there's no guarantee that if we honor God, he will remove all evils from your life. But we can be guaranteed of this, that the one who honors God, God will honor him. There is an honor coming for obedience to Christ in this life that will outlive this life. Thirdly, this evening, we see God giving Daniel and company scholastic and supernatural knowledge. By the way, the experiment I left out, um, verse 16, uh, the experiment got to continue. It was so successful, the overseer said, keep doing that, and they did it for the next three years. And we see in verse 17 that God gave Daniel and his friends scholastic and supernatural knowledge. Verse 17 says, as for these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence and every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. First of all, look at their scholastic success. They have graduated at the top of the class. God is behind every turn of events, even the success in their studies and in this verse, even with Daniel, some revelatory knowledge. In the first half of verse 17, we see they all became knowledgeable in every branch of literature and wisdom. And when you think about becoming knowledgeable in literature, that means they had to read. This was not a, a supernatural, instantaneous gift of knowledge. This was God giving them success in their studies. They did actually study. They had to do their reading. This is not supernatural revelation on exam day. You know, I've got a chemistry final. I've never cracked a book. I daydreamed through all the lectures. And then at small group, I share this prayer request. Please pray that God will help me pass my chemistry final. No, God blessed their studiousness, their efforts, their faithfulness in the small invisible things, faithfulness to the task at hand. 
God gave them knowledge and he gave them intelligence. And the second word for knowledge is a near synonym, but it has with it the idea of insight, skill, the skill of knowing what to do with information. We might call this discernment. And notice the beginning of verse 17, as for these four youths, that little phrase just means that Daniel, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah were standouts. You remember that there were more than those four taken from Judea, these four stand out. And there were more than simply Judean captives. There were Scythian and Egyptian captives just in the trip that Nebuchadnezzar made in his first trip to besiege Jerusalem. No doubt there were captives from all the nations which had been conquered by Babylon being trained in this fashion. And these four were standouts. God gave them success in their studies. Having facts and then having insight to those facts would indicate that they gained discernment or were given discernment. That is the ability to get an education while filtering truth and error. That which is good versus that which is better, that which is more valuable or less valuable information. And then the second half of verse 17 indicates Daniel particularly had this supernatural gift of understanding dreams and visions. And it seems perhaps like the difference between a dream and a vision is a dream is the revelatory thing you see when you're asleep and the vision is the revelatory experience you have while awake, if you experience those things. And as we will see, this will come by supernatural revelation. Daniel's ability to interpret dreams and visions was not from Babylonian learning. It was not from the wealth of literature of the Chaldeans who loved those kinds of things but got it wrong. This was God's direct revelation through Daniel the prophet. Daniel did not understand dreams by memorizing the charts that tell you what different dreams mean. I told you last week that there were hundreds of lists of explanations in the Babylonian sciences of what dreams meant. And not all dreams are revelatory. In fact, most dreams are not revelatory. Almost all human dreams just happen when synapses are crossed in interesting pathways based on what has come into the human mind. No doubt you've experienced dreams. Some of you can remember them, some of you can't. But it really is the product of the neural pathways that happen in the brain. They're not revelatory. There are people who take time to interpret those dreams. Uh, there are common dreams that uh, seem to happen to numbers of people, and you can do some research, you can buy the books, you can study what people have said dreams mean. And there's some common recurring dreams that people have. Being chased, for instance. I don't know if you have a being chased dream where you're running but not moving somehow. I don't know if you've ever been caught in a chased dream. Maybe you've had the dream of falling. Maybe you've had the dream of being back in school and not having studied for the exam. Uh, there are dreams that are common to a lot of people, and so people have written whole books. And so if you have this dream, this is what it means. If you have this dream, this is what it means. I haven't yet seen the explanation for the dream of when I'm skiing and I launch off of some precipice and then everything below me is dirt. That, for me, is about once a month. I don't know what it means, and I haven't found the book that explains it, but that's not the kind of dream interpretation Daniel had. That's just human guessing at common experiences of things in our muddled brains. In fact, what Daniel would be able to do by supernatural revelation is going to outshine all the centuries of Babylonian, Chaldean, and Akkadian dream interpretation because what he has is from the one true God. It'll be undeniable. There have been a few dreams in history that have been revelatory. They're not normal, they're not often. In fact, they often happened in biblical history to people who did not know or fear Yahweh. They convey a truth in a terrifying manner so as to humble the powerful of the earth that they might listen to God's messenger who is specially sent to interpret it. You remember Pharaoh and his dreams, or Abimelech in Genesis 20 had his dream. 
This is not a learnable skill. This is direct revelation from God. Fourthly, we see that God gave Daniel and his friends exceptional review before the king. Beginning at verse 18, at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. So at the end of the three-year period of training, they stood before the king. And that could be a phrase that either means they physically stood there for an interview or they stood before him in ongoing service. They were posted a position. And we find out that no one was like them, verse 19. The king talked with them. And out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And so they entered the king's service. That is, of of all those who were in school at this time, all those who had gone through the three-year training program, no one was like these four. They were the best of their class. They were the best of the class from the Judean captives. They were the best of the class from all the captives, from all the nations being trained for court officials. And look down at verse 20. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better, in Hebrew literally ten hands better, than all the magicians and conjurers who were in his realm. In other words, Daniel and his four friends were better than the teachers. They were better than their instructors in the training program. They were better than the professionals. This, of course, will provoke envy of them later. Uh, The word for magicians here is the word for scholars. It comes from the the word for stylus or that which you would use to make impressions into clay tablets to actually write stuff. So these magician scholars were the ones who were responsible for keeping the records, writing the textbooks on everything related to Babylonian science and magic. And then the conjurers were those who studied and practiced the casting of spells. Babylon prided itself in being the learning center of the ancient world at this time. And their ancient arts were prized well before the new Babylonia was an empire. And so these are the smartest guys in the room. They're the smartest guys in the ancient Near Eastern world. And these four students from Israel are smarter than all of them. Finally, in verse 21, we see that God made Daniel outlive the Babylonian empire. God made Daniel outlive the Babylonian empire. Daniel continued, verse 21, until the first year of Cyrus the king. So Nebuchadnezzar is king when they're taken captive. He's followed by evil Merodach, and then Nergal Sharezer, then Labashi Marduk, then Nabonidus, and then Belshazzar the son of Nabonidus who ruled in Babylon. And that takes us up to 539 BC when Cyrus came at night, conquered the city in one fell swoop and assassinated Belshazzar. We'll read about that event later in the book of Daniel. You have the end of the Babylonian empire. And ruler after ruler after ruler after ruler off the stage, who's still there? Daniel. Daniel, the the little kid from Israel, outlives the mighty Babylonian empire. Daniel chapter 10 tells us that Daniel went through at least the third year of Cyrus. The point in saying he went through Cyrus's first year here in this verse is just to say he went to the end of the Babylonian empire all the way up to the time when Babylon was gone. Author Dale Ralph Davis in his commentary in the book of Daniel says this, Babylon, the hairy-chested macho brute of the world, has dropped with a thud in the mausoleum of history while fragile Daniel, servant of the Most High God, is still on his feet. He's pictured a boxing match. And who won? Who outlived whom? And there's an eschatology embedded in verse 21. This really is a staggering verse. That Daniel outlives the Babylonian empire as a precursor to the reality that every faithful servant of God will outlive every wicked, evil, pagan empire that the world will have. God's saints will inherit the kingdom that will have no end. 
Daniel is just a preview of that reality. What do we learn from this chapter? I want to ponder some implications for us this evening as we reflect on Daniel. And Daniel, in a very real sense, is a hero here. The three friends of his are heroes. They're not the big hero. God is the one orchestrating these things. God is the one who granted Daniel a robust faith. God is the one who orchestrated Daniel's access to the word of God. God is the one who graciously sustained his servants in Babylonian exile. God is the one who gave them favor. God is the one who caused them to excel in their scholastics. God is the one who would give Daniel revelatory interpretation of visions and dreams. God is the actor here in this narrative. And we have to keep in mind what God is doing. He is demonstrating through his servants that he is the one true God. And he is, in fact, bigger and better than all the so-called gods of the nations. And that's just a reminder that Israel is not in exile because Yahweh is weak or uninterested. Israel is in exile precisely because they've disobeyed him. They've forfeited blessing by pursuing idolatry and rejecting the goodness of Yahweh. He'll demonstrate that by keeping them in exile for exactly the time he said, and then bringing them back to the land. We find that God will outstrip the best that Babylon has to offer. The young men's food would serve them better than Babylon's food. The young men's discernment would serve them better than Babylonian education. God himself would cause Babylon to crumble like every other kingdom, until he establishes his own kingdom on the earth. God will make his own name famous on the whole world's stage, but in the lives of his individual faithful servants until then, he is reminding them, he is reminding us that he is on his throne, he is in charge, he is interested in his people, and he will win. And we need that message. We need to understand here God's grace to sustain in trial. Daniel's dependence, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah, their dependence was on the Lord in a very difficult situation. We learn something from their resolute faithfulness. Whatever is God's directive, we must obey him come what may. It's not safe to disobey God, and we're tempted at times to think, I'll be safer if I do things my own way. I've got another plan here. You see, if I keep God's word according to God's standards, then people aren't going to like me, or I'll lose privilege, I'll lose lose access, I'll lose this scholarship, Uh, I won't get to eat the pulled pork sandwich and the ribeye steaks. But our safety always is in faithful, trusting obedience to God. And we say, come what may, God may providentially or even miraculously intervene to honor such obedience with blessing. He did in Daniel's case. He did in Daniel's friend's case. And we learn something here also about preparation for moments like this that Daniel had set upon his heart not to devile himself. He had placed upon his own heart the conviction that that he would not go against God's word. He had done serious heart preparation. His faithfulness here was not circumstantial or whimsical. Wake up one day, there's a trial, a temptation to compromise. What am I going to do? Daniel already knew what he would do. Are you preparing your heart now, fortifying it with convictions, fortifying it with the, the convictions that we just read in Psalm 119? In fact, I want you to turn back there And this particular stanza of Psalm 119 is so pertinent, beginning in verse 97, because resolute faith is not made in the moment. Resolute faith is to be pre-made. And it's not easy, and it's slow, and it's done in small things that nobody sees. This is Psalm 119, beginning in verse 97. Listen to it again. Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have observed your precepts. 
I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, even when I'm far away from home. For you yourself have taught me how sweet are your promises to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. For your precepts, from your precepts I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. What does it mean to pre-prepare your heart for this kind of trial? What does it mean to pave a pathway for conviction? Slow meditation on God's word as a regular diet. Only then will you be wiser than Ashpenaz, smarter than your instructors at Babylon University. Only then will you be prepared to so hate disobedience that you'd be willing to give up your life so as not to disobey. That doesn't happen in a moment, friends. That takes preparation. And then we learn from Daniel's demeanor. He was respectful, reasoned, and resolute. There's something about the truth that allows you to be calm and confident. It's liberating. If you know you're on the right side of Yahweh, again, you have nothing to fear. And you don't have to prove or vindicate Yahweh in your own strength with some sort of fleshly fight. Daniel could say, I don't want to defile myself. Can I have a different menu, please? Uh, no, I'll lose my head. Okay, uh, you're his assistant. Can, can I try a different menu for 10 days? And with the truth on his side, Daniel could with confidence and courtesy appeal. But we don't get to see in, in this narrative what would have happened if he went through all the appeals and still got refused. But I think we have every reason to believe Daniel would have withstood that test. We learned something about Daniel's leadership here. Uh, we don't have an indication that the four at first, asked for a different menu. Just Daniel is named in that. That would take courage, a severe courage to act alone. None of the other Judean youths are complaining about the menu. Of course, none of the other people in, from all the other lands that are conscripted there are complaining about the menu. Not even Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah yet. Daniel first. Daniel took a leap. Daniel took a step. That would take courage. It takes courage to act alone. And yet Daniel knew that before Yahweh, he was truly not alone. Think about the effect of Daniel's leadership for the example and encouragement of his three friends. Just think about the word encouragement. You are encouraging someone. You're giving someone courage. Daniel gave Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah courage. And they stood with him. What would their lives be like if Daniel wasn't there? Well, we actually get to find out. Daniel doesn't get prompted to go to the fiery furnace. It's Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And we're, we shouldn't think that, oh, well, Daniel compromised and he bowed down and worshiped the, the, uh, the statue. We'll talk about that more when we get there. I think Daniel was in the palace and the guys are out in the plain in Shinar and they're the ones subject to the liability of worshiping the statue. But Daniel's solo courage here gives them an example so that they, without Daniel, later on in the book, have similar courage. That kind of leadership is encouraging to others. Don't ever underestimate the effect of your courageous leadership on the faith of others. Look, we've all been encouraged by that way. You've seen someone go before by example and do something hard. Oh, that's how that's done. I, I want to do that. Those are encouraging. There's something for us to think too about our relationship to education here. We know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that Daniel and his friends had wisdom coming from God's word and a fear of God, and therefore they had insight and discernment into the kind of knowledge that they were receiving in their education. They were therefore wiser than all of their teachers not because they had spent a lifetime studying Akkadian and Babylonian and Chaldean magic formulas and dream interpretation books, 
but because they could see truth and error in the things they were forced to study, they were wiser. Everything was submitted to the fear of God. Everything they had to learn, all the geography, all the literature, all the science, all the astronomy, all the math was subjected under the rubric of fear of Yahweh. That's the beginning of wisdom. There's a lesson there in how to go to ASU, how to take a psych class and not believe everything you hear, how to sit in a molecular biology class and reject so much of what you hear, how to sit in a genetics class and actually believe in genetic entropy rather than evolution. How do you get there? Meditating on God's word. Believing God over against the white laboratory coats who don't know what they're talking about. You can be wiser than your teachers. And you can be respectful. There's a way to do that. There's a way to stay close to the heart of God, to study the material, pass the test, and not imbibe the worldview. I'm not suggesting you go to ASU because that's hard. There is a tightrope there. There is another education principle you have to have in mind, and that is the Psalm 1 principle. Do not stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of scoffers. Walk, stand, sit, scoffers, mockers. You will be like your teachers to some degree. If you have not fortified your mind to resist at the foundational level of truth, if you have not taught yourself that not everything you hear is true, if you have not taught yourself the lesson that well-beloved teachers can teach error and often do, and you've got to see through it as a student, you will not be prepared. This is a place to prepare yourself. And there, by the way, there's no environment you could possibly be educated in that is free from this danger. There is a skill to not going with the flow in education and in fortifying your mind to not accepting everything that you have taught, but putting it all through the filter of God's word. But there's a command in 1 Thessalonians 5.21 where Paul says, examine everything carefully. And John Anderson has translated that, scrutinize everything. That command is a lifesaver in education, a soul preserver in education. And we have to believe that Daniel and his friends maintained their gravitational pull to the word of God to protect them from indoctrination. There's something to be learned about small decisions here. What's at stake in a small decision? A small stand for truth, uh, something that nobody would see, uh, something that perhaps that your peers around you wouldn't agree with. Why are you making scruples about that? It's, it's just not a big deal. It's bacon. <laughs> Haven't you tried it? What's at stake in that? And for Daniel, everything was at stake in a compromise like that. The small decision is where life counts. It is where the battle is when no one sees. Listen, if you have an idea that I want to really serve God, I want to do big things for God, the big thing is in the little thing right here. This fight against sin, this battle against compromise, everything's at stake in this little decision. I want to think again about the temptations to cave in that Daniel and his friends would have faced. Think about the excuses they could have made. Well, you know, we, we can't offend the king. Uh, when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. Uh, look, the, the king's command is life or death. It, it's not worth losing your life over a BLT. It's not, losing the, it's not worth losing the loss of opportunity or, or advancement or influence. Think of all the things we could do in this kingdom if, if we had favor before the king. We, we better not step on his toes. Another excuse would, would just simply be, look, everybody else is eating the food. That peer pressure is violent. You felt it in junior high. I know I felt it in junior high. I've probably told you about the shoes that I really, really wanted, the British Knights, and my parents didn't get me the British Knights until a year after everybody had stopped wearing them. <laughs> it was humiliating. Why? Not because they were bad shoes, but because it's not what everybody else was doing. And you feel that viscerally. And you parents who have your kids in school right now, you know they feel that viscerally. Every other kid at school has a smartphone. Have you heard that one? All my friends have this app and that app. 
even at Grace Bible Church, all my church friends, fill in the blank. It is hard to stand against that, and it's hard as parents not to give in to that because you love your kids. I don't want my kids to be weird. Look, Daniel and his friends were weird, and that was okay. Look, another excuse, look, it's good food we're rejecting. Who, who would want to reject good food? Another excuse, I'm young. I can't be expected to, you know, have these kind of mature, fully orbed convictions. I mean, that's like grown-up stuff. And God expected a 14-year-old to have those convictions, and he blessed it. You, you may be aware that the whole idea of adolescence is a 20th century American invention. It's a myth. It doesn't exist. Yet most other cultures throughout human history have had childhood and adulthood, and this middle ground where we just say, well, we're going to give you lots of stuff, but no responsibilities. It's tragic. And we don't expect adult behavior from a 14-year-old, and we should. And we set low expectations for them, uh, that is not a biblical model. One excuse could be the change in setting. Now, obviously, God's will is for me to be here. I mean, then God wants me to be happy, and so the things that are here that make me happy must be part of God's will too. I'm far away from home. No one will know. Uh, those are just ceremonial laws. I'm not killing anybody. Life is hard. You know, when life is hard, our hearts feel entitled to some recompense, often in terms of some sin, some little indulgence. Man, this week's been really, really hard. I, I, I deserve a break today. I deserve a break from the fight for holiness. I deserve a break from, you know, battling indulgence. All Just a little indulgence. We feel entitled to it somehow in our flesh because life's been hard. Could you imagine these boys hauled off from home, a thousand miles across the desert, and then in enemy territory? <laughs> what does God expect from me? Daniel might have been tempted to think, well, I tried, but you know, Ashpenaz wouldn't let me eat kosher. <laughs> I tried, Lord, but I mean, that's just the law. It's, I gotta submit to Ashpenaz. End of story. Daniel didn't give up. And you know, a really dangerous heart temptation is just simple bitterness at God. Hey, we're in exile. God didn't seem to care enough about us to keep us in our homes and to bless us in the land. Why should I see fit to care about God that much? And the heart just grows bitter towards God's expectations. All of a sudden, his sweet regulation of our lives feels like a burden we have resentment toward him, we complain in our hearts, and we just so badly worship at the idolatry of comfort that we want our circumstance to change and we're willing to sin to change it. That is a recipe for spiritual disaster. God is good and that never changes. We sing, great is thy faithfulness tonight. Do you know where that song comes from? That's Lamentations 3, when Jeremiah is sitting on the hill overlooking the city of Jerusalem under siege from Nebuchadnezzar. And, and the people are so impoverished, the people are so starving that they are committing awful acts, mothers eating their own children. Jeremiah is sitting on the hill weeping. That's what Lamentations are all about. And he sings, great is thy faithfulness. <laughs> what is he saying? God is faithful to himself. And this siege and subsequent exile is right in keeping with his promises. And you know what that leads me to believe? That God will keep all of his promises. <laughs> which will be for the good of God's faithful. There's a lesson here in the importance of godly homes. I mean, look, King Josiah, as a young man, left a legacy that others could follow, maybe even Daniel. 
And did Daniel's parents name him Daniel because they were theologically astute and they wanted their son to always remember, fear God and don't worry about anybody else? How shall a young man keep his way pure? Last implication. By keeping it according to your word. Let's pray. Lord, you have said that you would honor those that honor you. And we recognize, just in looking at Daniel's example, looking at your work in these four choice servants, how far short we fall. In our own hearts and minds, in our diligence, in our meditation on your word, in our clinging to your word, under much less severe circumstances, much easier times. And God, we want to be like these young men. Oh, that we could retrace our steps and go back to small decisions and undo small compromises. But we stand here today under your word, eager to yield, eager to submit our lives in trusting obedience to you, longing to see you bless those obediences, whether in this life or the next, whatever it may cost us, we want to be faithful to you. And we know, God, that we have no power in and of ourselves for such things, and so we ask, we plead, and we want to put ourselves under your word. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.